Well, it is day 40 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and world leaders have condemned atrocities in towns retaken by Ukrainian forces. Well, authorities say they've found what looks exactly like war crimes, and they've accused Russia of committing a massacre. Well, in Bucha, just outside the capital of Kyiv, bodies of civilians with bound hands and close-range gunshot wounds were found. Evidence of torture and mass graves was also present. Well, the Prime Minister condemned what he called the despicable civilian attacks, saying they were yet more evidence of war crimes. Ukrainian President Zelensky, addressing the Grammy Awards just a few hours ago, urged viewers to tell the truth about the war. The, revolution, the revelations of civilian executions come after a weekend of fighting around the capital, which Ukrainian forces liberated the entire Kyiv region. Well, joining us now to discuss the situation in Bucha and the broader fight against Russian forces is retired Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell. Welcome to the program. And look, unfortunately, the newspapers this morning all leading with this story, actually absolutely unspeakable horrors being uncovered from around Ukraine. Yes, good, good, good morning, Isabel. It, it, it's awful to see this stuff appear. Um, it's very difficult to comment on objectively. Um, I think, I mean, a veteran, a lot of our uh, military have been veterans of war these last 20 or 30 years, and um, there's nothing pleasant about war and uh, wars of national survival, which is what Ukraine's involved in at the moment, are particularly brutal. And I think, uh, fortunately, we've got the international community roused and the inspectors will collect the evidence. And as with previous conflicts will uh, assess where war crimes have actually been committed and uh, bring those perpetrators to account, which is uh, what we all hope will happen. Mm -hmm. Sean, it, it shocks you, but does it surprise you? Um, unfortunately, Eamon, um, I, I think in a way, the, ever since the Second World War, we, we've been involved more of wars of choice in this country, and such uh, dro dreadful scenes happen a long way away, and they're not really piped into our living room. Um, the, the last time we had a war of national survival, which very few people, unfortunately, in this country are alive to remember, um, that's the last time we had similar sorts of levels of uh, casualties and uh, sort of indiscriminate uh, targeting of civilians as well as military. And I think um, the, the, certainly the veterans who I meet as part of my sort of more charitable side, um, many of them won't talk about these times. And, and much of it is because the, the scenes were so dreadful. And, uh, and yet they, they happen in wars of national survival and nobody can excuse it. Uh, it's horrible to be piped into a living room. But unfortunately, this is the harsh realities of what happens uh, in war. Uh, there is a shift in the rhetoric now, isn't there? Initially, this invasion was being blamed squarely on President Putin. But when you see evidence like this, when you see that Russian soldiers, whether they were conscripts, whether they were professionals, have committed these awful crimes, tortured children, uh, bound women, reports of horrific rapes, that being uploaded onto uh, pornography sites. I mean, absolutely awful scenes from places around the capital of Ukraine. It's shifting things now. This is, this is a change. Uh, and we heard yesterday President Zelensky calling on the mothers of Russian soldiers, asking them to look at these pictures and to see the butchers that they'd raised. Yes, I, uh, Isabel, I, I, I certainly, um, uh, there's no way I can be an apologist for what's going on, but I, but I do think we, we also have to be very careful, the impartiality of the Western press. We are only hearing, uh, there's a war of information going on at the moment, and um, I think finding the truth of what's actually happened is exactly what we are very good at in the West. And I think whatever the, the narrative, whatever the dreadful pictures we're seeing, you know, I, I do think it's very difficult to comment objectively about this. And that's why the international community quite rightly are collecting the evidence and in the fullness of time, those who have perpetrated these what look like dreadful crimes will be brought to book. Mm. Sean, here we are, uh, day 40 of this invasion. Um, you, you, as a retired Air Vice Marshal, uh, have you changed your mind in any way? Do you think we should uh, tweak or think about how we're providing air cover or what happens next? Well, Eamon, that, that, that is a, the, the, the key question, isn't it? I think um, 
from I think the most of the assessment of the intelligence community is that uh, Putin's initial plan of taking the country in a couple of days spe failed spectacularly. And I think, as we saw around Kiev, we saw in the last few days a sort of consolidation of the of the Russian positions whilst they were scratching their heads to work out what do we do next. The very fact we're seeing troops, you know, relocate from the uh, the capital and Hostomel being. And uh, you know, um, moved out of. I mean, Russians would have fought very hard over Hostomel airfield air, air because it was strategically important if they were to take Kiev. The very fact that they have uh, moved out of that implies that the Russians have now got a plan B. And I think we're seeing that increased focus around Mariupol. The situation there looks desperate. We're also seeing the Donbass, I suspect, will become a focus. Why is that? Three main reasons. The, the, the Donbass, the Russians have invested in that over the last decade with insurgency, and I'm sure they'll want to sort that out. Second reason is because the Russians have had all sorts of problems with logistics, but of course the Donbass is on the Russian border, so it will make life easier for them to get men, materiel, um, weapons, fuel, etc., to feed the fight. And thirdly, uh, as you say, the air power, the Russian Air Force really has been uh, neutered during this campaign, probably because of the effectiveness of the Ukraine resistance. But of course, if they are supporting their troops right next to the Russian border, then it'll be a lot easier for Russia to bring air power to play. And finally, of course, down in Odessa, we've seen the fuel um, facilities bombed. Um, it's difficult for the analysts to work out what's going on there because Odessa is, you know, best part of a thousand miles away from Russia. So if Russia had resupply problems in Kyiv, it's going to have big ones if it, if it tackled Odessa. And I think there are not many land troops near uh, Odessa at the moment, and the Black Sea Fleet wouldn't uh, uh, attempt an amphibious landing without large land support. So, and of course, uh, I only found out the other day in Odessa there's 2,500 kilometres of catacombs underneath the city. So, the defenders w would almost certainly staunchly defend that. So, it's quite difficult to see how Odessa will be a target. So, it's more that sending a message the international community that Russia is not finished, that this is simply was the end of phase one and we're starting phase two. And also a message to the Ukrainians, just because you're a thousand miles away does not make you safe. Uh, no, and I suppose the question to politicians in the West uh, will be this morning how they respond to this. And as you say, widespread condemnation and gathering of war crimes is one thing. But is there perhaps a, going to be a renewed call for a strengthening of sanctions in the light of, of the images that we're seeing over the weekend and this morning? Well, I, it's difficult for me to comment on um, sanctions. That's more a political measure. From a military perspective, it's difficult to see how sanctions will have any impact in the near term on what Putin is doing in Ukraine. I think much more likely for Putin is, depending on what his revised objectives are, if he has revised them, uh, until he's achieved those, then he won't be interested in negotiating. And I think um, most of the commentators believe if he hasn't changed his objectives and still holds the ambition to take Ukraine, then this war could extend into years rather than days. Um, if, if, as most of the military folks would almost certainly be advising him if he's listening, that this is a step too far and actually um, he should modify his expectation, then uh, it looks likely that he would um, settle on the Donbass, Mariupol, the land bridge down to the Crimea, and then perhaps be in a position to negotiate. Um, the trouble is I, I, I'm, I'm not confident at the moment that the conditions are set for Putin to come to the table. Uh, and in particular, even if he did today, um, the key issue of security, how on earth would President Zelensky be able to take any guarantee of security for what uh, of the 90% of Ukraine that potentially he would retain, given that Putin has invaded twice in the last 10 years um, and reneged on a deal signed in 1994 when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons with guarantees of security, of sovereignty and its borders that was signed by Russia at the time. So how on earth would any such agreement be able to be ratified? Uh, and um, can, could Zelensky have any confidence whatsoever that Putin would, would stand by his word. So I think it's, um, I, w I hope we are all wrong, but it doesn't look likely that we're coming to a quick resolution of this conflict. Mm. Sean Bell is a retired Air Vice Marshal. Sean, really appreciate your take on things. Thank you very much indeed.
your time this morning.